Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12066, Land Law. We're in week two of Term 2, 2018. And tonight we're dealing with a range of issues, but primarily in relation to issues to do with indefeasibility and land tenure. Thank you, those that have joined us live, for those that are watching this as a recorded session. Please consider joining us on a Thursday evening at 7pm Queensland time. Um, I'm going to ask people to mute their microphone if you're not asking a question or making a comment. That said, I do encourage you to do both of those things throughout the evening. All right, so before I start, are there any concerns, any issues? Are we travelling well enough? You might note I'm, not try I'm trying not to overload you with reading. I think the textbook is really an excellent place to look. But as you'll see during the course of the... Um, sessions that I give, I'll be encouraging you to look at the raw material, the um, primary sources, which of course you'll recall from introduction to law days, relates to legislation and case law. Okay, so last week we got to a certain stage, we were talking about planning, we we're talking about ecological development, but in that concept of planning there is the issue of property agreements and covenants. And just be aware that these issues are quite often off title. So when we talk about off title or off register, I'm really talking about some sort of unregistered interest. And um, that's appropriate for our discussion tonight because the basis upon which the Torrens system works is one of registration. And whilst I guess the intention is for that which is registered to be conclusive and comprehensive, there are still important off um, title documents that you must consider within the overall context. Just um, so that you better understand, when we talk about the Torrens system, which is in itself now very well established and really quite old, old system title worked in a different way. We didn't look at a title register in order to ascertain ownership. Um, and now I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I didn't do this, but um, I'm not quite that old. But there are still some pockets of, of old title. But um, the, old, the system of old title registration, or sorry, old title um, tenure or ownership was to look at a series of documents which ultimately concluded in a result that the person properly owned the land. And it meant looking back in time. Um, very inefficient method and um, a lot of work. Um, so Torrent system works much better than... Uh, could possibly have otherwise been the case. Now you're familiar with what we mean by the Torrent system and the basis of registration. With registration um, and the Torrent system, you need to know the Land Title Act and some of the provisions, we'll talk about that. And some of the leading cases, don't be too hung up on the cases. I'm not going to give you an exam question that says, deal with Gibbs and Messer or Fraser and Walker or Bresk, Far and Wall. I want you to read those sorts of cases, be aware of them um, and be prepared to acknowledge them, but you don't need to worry about them in too much detail. There'll be no direct question on those cases. But when we're talking about the nature of real property in its modern context, we're talking about issues to do with registration and the issue of indefeasibility. Now in that context, the quote that you'll see very often, which is in your study guide, is from um, Chief Justice Barwick in Breskvar and Wall, 1971-126-CLR-376. And in that um, decision, in that often quoted um, statement, uh, Chief Justice Barwick said that the Torrent system is one where title to land is derived by registration, uh, from registration. It is a it is a system of title by registration and not one of registration by title. So in simple terms, what we're really saying is that once you're on the title, the concept is that your entitlement is indefeasible. And that is backed up by cases such as Breskvar and Wall and earlier, uh, prior to that, the Privy Council decision of Fraser and Walker. Again, have a look at the title itself, the certificate of title, and be aware uh, that 
there are the reservations of mineral and petroleum rights. Formerly, that was a requirement under um, specific reservation. Now it's a general uh, requirement for all uh, legal matters or all land. Okay, um, so when we talk about registration, it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that we're only talking about transfers and ownership. But there is a difference between ownership and being a proprietor. It's a little subtle, but the difference is this, and have a look at the definitions in the Land Titles Act for some elaboration on this. But in essence, one can be the registered owner, which entitles you to be the registered proprietor as owner, but you can also be a registered proprietor as a mortgagee or as a lessee. So when we talk about being a proprietor, it's a slightly broader concept than being an owner. And when we talk about being an owner in Torrens title concepts, we're really talking about ownership in fee simple as the gold standard, which is still subject to the reservations that we've discussed to do with mineral and petroleum rights. And of course, subject to anything that is generally registered on title. So what do we normally see? What sort of encumbrances would we normally expect to see on a title if there are going to be there? So what type of encumbrances are normally registered? Gregory says easements, yes. Right of way, which is a form of easement, yes. Thank you for those contributions. What else would we, what other type of encumbrance is commonly seen on a title? Lease, mortgage, lease. Yes, they're the key ones. Caveat, thank you. So when you're looking at a title, obviously you're looking very closely to see if these things are there. There might be notifications. So for example, in the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, it's quite common for members such as me to appoint people to act as administrators. And if the person who owns the property is um, who is subject to an administration order, then one of the standard orders of the tribunal will be for the administrators to record the fact of the administration on the title. Um, so that type of notification will appear and it gives an idea to members of the public that they must deal with not the registered owner, but they must own, uh, they must deal with the administrator. Nadine's come in with another excellent example, owner builder notifications. So these are not encumbrances, but they are records on the title that provide valuable information that must be considered. So leases, let's go back and have a look at those. Now, firstly, easements registered on title. What type of easements would you expect to see on a title? We've talked about right of way, we've talked about access. What other utilities? Yes, not always on the title. There may be a statutory easement, service easements, easements in gross utilities. Easement in gross is good. That's um, um, that, uh, given by the uh, owner of the property themselves. Council land, road easement. So there's a whole range of different types of easements. Now, generally speaking, when we're thinking about something on the title, which is an easement, we're, talk we're thinking about something that burdens the property, don't we? So we're talking about an easement from the perspective of the servient tenement. However, it might be a benefit easement, in which case we're talking about it from the perspective of the dominant tenement. tenement. So easements can go both ways in that regard. Leases will often see on title. What type of leases generally would you expect could be on a title deed? Can you give me some idea of the type of lease that might be capable of registration? Profit or prondra? Yes. That's more an entitlement to yes, go onto property and extract. All right, what about crown leases? Three years or longer, says Greg. Yes, for a commercial lease. Um, that's good. I wanted to see that issue of three three years come out. Pastoral, yes. Um, I knew what you were talking about, Justice. Um, C 
So when we talk about a crown lease, um, it's often a lengthy term. It might be a 99 year lease, for example. A standard commercial lease would generally be for a much shorter period of time and generally three years or longer. The significance of three years or longer will come to shortly when we come to consider some of the definitions in the Land Title Act. Um, and we'll talk about options as well in that context. So, but not residential tenancy leases. So you wouldn't expect to see on a title to someone's residential home, a registered residential lease, partly because we don't see many residential leases that are three years or longer, typically six months or 12 months. So we don't expect normally to see those sorts of leases, but generally some sort of crown lease or some sort of commercial lease. Now, on the topic of commercial leases, there are different types of leases, even within the concept of commercial leases. There's a general commercial lease and there's a retail shop lease. Can anyone tell me the difference or the philosophy behind having different types of commercial leases? Any ideas? Anyone willing to unmute their microphone, give it a go? So when we talk about a retail shop lease, as we'll do during this unit, be aware that it is a commercial lease, it's not a residential lease, but we mention it in, to contrast it from, if you like, a general commercial lease. So you might have a commercial lease that is a retail shop lease, or you might have a commercial lease that is not a retail shop lease. You'll need to consider the Retail Shop Leases Act in that regard, and we will talk about it. Okay, so, Retail shop leases are essentially designed, well, the, the, the idea was that they're introduced to provide some further protection over and above the general law to small retailers in large shopping centres. That was the rationale. And the government introduced a special regime for obtaining redress for problems associated with a retail shop lease by going to the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal, that is in its general jurisdiction, not its minor civil disputes jurisdiction. If you have a dispute in relation to a general commercial lease, you would not go to the tribunal, you'd go to a court. If you have a dispute in relation to a Residential Tenancies Act lease, you would go to QCAT, but in its minor civil disputes jurisdiction, not its um, general jurisdiction. So, so can I ask a question on that? Yes, indeed. Thanks. Um, my understanding of Retail Leases Act provisions allows, uh, say, a shopping centre like a large one at Chermside in Brisbane, uh, like a Westfield, and a shop owner, say, an ice cream shop, if they've lifted the lease, then in terms of you know the uh, the value of it, that the ice cream um, shop can contest that and seek specialised valuation advice. That specialised valuer will actually seek a dispensation from Westfield and the ice cream business so that they're not dragged into the court um, and that they will apportion what they believe is a fair value and generally either side is supposed to accept it. Is that then when it goes to QCAT? Well, that's part of it, um, and you're right. So that's quite a specialised question. I'll, I'll just explain, elaborate on that a bit more. So when you talk about lifting the rent, I think you're talking about an increase in the rent at an annual review or at the expiry of the, um, of the lease term. Is that correct? In which case, um, it's open for the parties, the tenant, to challenge the amount which is being sought by the landlord, say the property owner, and in the event of a dispute, you're right, the parties will introduce a valuer to make a determination. And not a general valuer, you are right, it would be a specialist retail shop lease valuer to make that determination. Um, the, the intent is that what the valuer says goes. However, there are some ways around that. Um, and one of the ways to attack that, and again, this is a bit specialised for weeks down the track, but one of the ways to attack that 
is to argue that the um, specialist valuer uh, did not base the valuation on the correct um, primary assumptions and therefore the valuation was flawed in its methodology. So I, I don't want to go into that too much just yet. It's a little bit too specialised. But in general terms, you're right. Um, and that would be a matter that could be disposed of in the tribunal. Another thing is um, more to do with compensation. So if, for example, you have a situation where a commercial tenant under a, a retail shop lease feels that as a result of the actions of a landlord, they are suffering a particular problem or loss, then the compensation claim is something that can be brought to the tribunal in its general um, jurisdiction, not its minor civil disputes jurisdiction. I hope that provides some clarification and thank you for that question, Greg. It's very good. Okay, so what we're trying to what I'm trying to do is highlight that even though this concept of land law, um, the concept of registration of indefeasibility might seem very straightforward and down the line. We have issues where there are things that are registered, not registered, and we have some types of interests, such as leases, where there is an expectation of it being registered. Um, there is no expectation of it being registered. And then we have different jurisdictions that provide the possibility of redress in the event of default or, or of disputes. So, and Residential Tenancies Act, um, as I said, goes to the minor civil disputes. Beyond that, there are other property interests that we haven't discussed that are very real. So, for example, retirement villages. So, retirement villages has its own legislation. There are, another example, statutory rights that apply for border, borders and lodges. So, they have different types of rights. And there are, I think there are emerging areas of practice uh, for example, Airbnb and planning issues associated with that, um, I, I suspect that there will be specialist uh, legislation brought in to deal with these emerging areas of practice. Okay, so what we're really talking about in, in many ways is property. We're talking about property as a concept and we're talking about how property can be a relationship between parties, which is contractual, or an interest in land. And then there's a the question of how do we deal with the registration of that ownership or that proprietorship? So a good case to remember in terms of describing property is Yanna against Easton, Eaton, Yanna and Eaton, 1999, 201 CLR 351. I mean, that's, that's important that case because it says, if you're trying to, to, to describe property, there's really no universal definition. And that property can be used to describe many kinds of relationship between a person and a subject matter. So I'm pointing out this case as a case to say, don't get too hung up on property in general terms, because there is no real definition of it. But you'll see specific definitions for things like property in different pieces of legislation. So the Personal Property um, Security Register um, legislation is different to um, Planning Act, for example. Okay, so one thing that we didn't see when I was asking for a list of interests in real estate that perhaps may be registered are licences. We did see Profit of Prondra, which I think is a, is a more a licence than a lease, but some licences, like a Profit of Prondra, the right, to, for example, to remove timber or gravel or something, carries with it a proprietary interest. Um, but I think that's really a license. And license is really a permission to enter onto land. It's not exactly an easement situation, um, but it's, a, it's a, an opportunity to enter onto land lawfully. So, for example, people that are contractors or people that are spectators um, at a sporting event. Now, those of you that have, that have studied trusts or equity might recall the case of Cowell against Rose Hill Racecourse. Do you remember that case? All right. Um, and that was in 1937. 
56 CLR 605, a spectator was asked to leave a race meeting, refused to do so, essentially arguing that he had a, contract, uh, had a proprietary interest, but um, the court said, no, it's a contractual matter um, and there was no proprietary interest um, as such. Okay, so in a way, what I'm trying to explain is that there, these images, these concepts can be more complex than you'd think and the um, issues can become a little blurred. So lease int coming back to leasehold interests, we've mentioned uh, the difference basically between commercial and residential. And within commercial, we have the difference between short term, which is up to three years and long term, which is three years or more. Um, and then we have the difference between general commercial and retail shop lease. But there are other types of leasehold interests. For example, a fixed term lease, you know, a lease for five years, a periodic lease, which is month by month, a tenancy at will is another type of leasehold interest or a tenancy at sufferance. So you'll see different types of leases or tenancies described throughout the material. Beyond that, there are other interests in land that we haven't discussed. For example, an option to lease or an option to purchase or a preemptive right. What's another term for preemptive right? Does anyone know? Any thoughts? Preemptive right? I'll go with right of first refusal. Um, another one, specialist, is put and call option. So just remember these are all different types of interests in property and some of them tie in neatly with contract law. Then of course we have the issue of registered versus unregistered which comes back to indefeasibility which is the key for tonight. And we have the issues to do with conflict of competing interests. People, for example, that have purchased property against the holders of, of security, against people that have a lease interest. So there are lots of ways that people can claim an interest in property. And there is therefore the possibility of disputes arising. And whenever I think about disputes, I'm always keen for you to think about remedies what is the appropriate remedy? What is the appropriate court or tribunal? So you'll see that as a recurring theme when I'm discussing matters. So rather than just tell me something about the legal position, it's good practice, I think, to go beyond that and say, here is the legal position. A would be correct in this dispute against B. Here are the reasons why. Now, here are the, now here, and here's the extra bit, the important bit. Here are the remedies available to A in the event of it pursuing, taking action against B. So here are the remedies available. And here is the court or tribunal where A should seek the remedy available against B. Does that make sense? And you'll see that in the assessment pieces that I provide you. Commonly, it's just tell me about the law, tell me what is the legal position, but then tell me what, what are we going to do about it? Because that's what clients want to know. So some of the equitable remedies, we know specific performance, we know injunctions, um, com common law remedies, breach of contract, damages, we know that. Can I ask you this question? Now, who does anyone, everyone knows what I mean by specific performance, don't they? If you don't, don't be ashamed. You can just ask. Yes? We're getting a lot of yeses. All right. Well, I'm getting one yes. Did the others know specific performance? All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. All right. Now we're getting lots of yeses. Okay. I'm going to ask you this question. In the event of a party to a contract for the sale and purchase of real estate, for no good reason defaulting and refusing to settle is specific performance an option available 
to the party that is innocent in those circumstances, just in general terms. We're getting yes, 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 if there's a contract, yes, yes, yes. All right, we're getting a lot of yeses. Does that remedy of specific performance apply equally for buyers and sellers who are innocent? Yes, was the first vote. Now we've slowed down a little bit with our voting. Yes, unsure. You probably tell from the way I'm wording this that it's a little bit of a trick. Okay, let's have a look at this. So you've got a contract for the sale and purchase of real estate. The buyer does everything right turns up at settlement and the seller for no good reason says, change my mind, going to keep it, don't want to. In those circumstances, based on the answers you've given me, the buyer could seek an order for specific performance. I think we're agreed on that. Cooling off period applies though. Mm, what if we're well past the cooling off period? Um, and, and of course, if the buyer wants to proceed, the cooling off period is really for the seller, uh, sorry, for the buyer's benefit. So the buyer says, no, I don't, want to, I don't want to pull out of the deal and quite the opposite. I want to go ahead. The seller's refusing to go ahead in those circumstances. I think there's probably good argument for the buyer to seek an order for specific performance. In other words, I would say that is, a, a, is an appropriate remedy. But what about a seller? The seller turns up, got my title deed, I'm ready to go. And the buyer who has the cash says, nah, change my mind, I'm not going ahead. If you're acting for the seller in those circumstances, would you recommend pursuing an application for specific performance? Specific performance and damages, deposit loss, only after cooling off period, yes. Damages, damages. So we're getting some different answers now in terms of the remedies, once unconditional. So let's assume, for example, in the scenario that I've given you, that we're acting for a seller in an unconditional contract, the buyer for no good reason has elected not to proceed. I would have thought that in those circumstances, damages would be an adequate remedy. So in other words, I'm giving an answer, one answer for an aggrieved seller which is different remedy to an aggrieved buyer. Now, am I just being unfair or is there some logical reason for that? Bearing in mind that specific performance is an equitable remedy, yes? And the general rule would be that the equitable remedy would only be available in the event of that. Scott, did you want to add something? Yeah, isn't equity to put them in the position they were? Yes, put them back in their position, in the position they were, yep. So then seeking specific performance wouldn't be actually in the position they were as such? Well, depends what you mean by the position they were in. Um, because right. as far as the buyer is concerned, the position I'm in now is that I've got a contract and uh, I want that particular land. You see, the reason I'm saying that it, there is a difference in all likelihood is that land is unique. In other words, if a buyer is disappointed and the seller won't proceed to settlement, the buyer can buy some other property, but it's not gonna be that property. It's not gonna be the same property. Whereas if a seller is disappointed and the buyer refuses, well, basically cash is cash, isn't it? Um, so it's not as though we're dealing from the seller's perspective with something which is unique. For more guidance on that, have a look at a decision of Chan against Cresden, PTYLTD, 1989 168 CLR 242. And bear in mind that equitable remedies are discretionary. All right, land use and land rights. Now, I started tonight by saying that when you're looking at the interests in real estate, you need to consider things which are registered and unregistered. And it's very important when considering what you can do with land, what you can do with property, 
as to planning standards and zoning charts. In other words, that whole area of planning and environment law is important in this context. The key legislation in Queensland in terms of the planning process is, this one, there's no, no surprise here, the Planning Act. Planning Act 2016, that act replaced the Sustainable Planning Act, which in turn replaced the Integrated Planning Act. So the Planning Act 2016 provides the mechanism, the process by which development can occur and it talks about how state, regional and local documents come into play in determining this in practice. So when you're talking about the use of land, think about the Planning Act, think about local planning instruments, the Planning Regulation 2017. We've mentioned mining a couple of times. Um, bear in mind the role that is to be played from the Environmental Protection Act 1994. And when we talk about mining and developing of land, always think about native vegetation. And um, there's some very good material about the National Vegetation Framework. In terms of remedies, I would like you to have some knowledge of the Planning and Environment Court and be aware of the work of that court as opposed to the work of say the Supreme Court or the District Court or the Queensland Civil and Administrative Tribunal because in appropriate circumstances, depending on the question that you get, your remedy may be to go to the Planning and Environment Court. So in short, the PE Court deals with planning and, and development matters, environment protection, coastal protection, fisheries, marine park, um, vegetation management. Very embarrassing if you turn up at the wrong court or tribunal. Any it's questions so far? Yes. Sorry, it's Monique. Um, I've just got my video off because I'm in my pyjamas. But um, last week in tutorial, you ran through a list of, you know, possible issues and asked us to comment on which court might be the appropriate forum. And again, mentioned some today. What I'm wondering is, is there somewhere I can access uh, a collated list of this type of information or could we work to put one together um, as a group or as some way of creating a resource like that, if there isn't one? Yes, and I don't think there is a resource. I mean, I, it's one of, the, one of these days I'll get around to writing a book, but I mean, I think that's a valuable thing because I keep saying it. Um, and no, I haven't created one. And I don't think there is one that I, certainly not one I've seen in all of the material. Because um, I, felt, um, I felt like I knew very little last week and I wanted to capture that information and be able to then, I guess, you know, learn it and refer to it. Um, but I didn't know where to look. I think that would be an excellent project for the class. We, oh, maybe, sorry, we can start, <laughs> we can, maybe we can start doing something. No, I think it's great. And maybe start adding to, uh, to something. All right, Sarah agrees. Um, yep, very good. So thank you, Monica. That's great. Uh, Monique, sorry, and I, um, I agree. I think we need to do something and, uh, and I'll try and support that process. I won't necessarily lead it, um, but I will supplement it and I'll keep an eye on it. Okay, so the law of real property is a little more complex than you'd think. There are complex relationships there are different ways of dealing with registration. There are reservations to the Crown. We have, in relation to the same property, a number of people that may claim an interest in that property. There are different ways of uh, pursuing remedies and there are different jurisdictions and different courts. So that's where we're at so far. Now let's talk about the Torren system. What are the key points of Torren system, just in summary? The first is, and you probably remember this from foundations, but the first is it's different to the old title system of land ownership. Don't worry about the old title system. There will not be a question on the exam about that. In short, we don't really care about that, but we mentioned it just to say, well, Torrens system hasn't been there forever. There was something before it. You need to, of course, understand the concept of interfeasibility of title and 
the theoretical more than real difference between deferred and immediate indefeasibility of title. I think the case law, Fraser and Walker, Bresfar and Wall, really says when we're talking about indefeasibility, we're talking about immediate indefeasibility. There was the reference to Gibbs and Messer. I don't think you need to worry about that too much. I think just think in terms of immediate indefeasibility of title and the leading case case or cases, Bresfar and Wall and maybe Fraser and Walker. But don't worry, they won't be, that, they won't be on the exam as I mentioned. We need to consider the extent of protection provided through registration and there are some basics and we need to consider the um, <clears throat> uh, concepts of competing interests. Gregory says, ah, Gregory's got started already with our list of um, courts, remedies, great. Um, I'm looking forward to this. I'm really pleased that you raised that, Monique, and thank you for following through on that, uh, Sarah and Gregory, Gregory, I can see. Okay, now, what's the key act legislation that deals with the issue of indefeasibility? I think you'll all know this, quick on your buzzers, LTA 794, very good. Um, part three deals with freehold land register. I really want you to look at part three, which is sections 27 through 46 inclusive. Obviously, the key sections relate to the creation and meaning of indefeasible title. You must look at 37 and 38. They're pretty easy sections to read. Um, what is the meaning of indefeasible title? Well, it, it's a lot where the title um, particulars are on the freehold land register of a, of a lot. One thing it might be useful for you to do while you're reading these sections is maybe even on a different screen, have the dictionary for the Land Title Act, which is in Schedule 2. I'm just going to draw your attention to a few of the more important um, definitional parts of that schedule. Firstly, in, um, Certificate of Title means a certificate issued by the Registrar under Section 42. An instrument, you'll see reference to this a lot, an instrument. Does anyone know what an instrument is? If you're really quick, you just go to Schedule 2 and read it. And then you can say, yes, I know exactly what an instrument is. But what's an instrument? You see it a lot in land law. You're all diving to Schedule 2 now, aren't you? Contract, document the paper certificate of title. Yes, so the first one is the deed of grant or the certificate of title, that's the first one. Written document, says Karen. Um, if we look at the definition, it's in eight parts. Um, a deed of grant or certificate of title, a will grant of representation or exemplification, a deed that relates to or may be used by a lot, a power of attorney that may be used with a lot, a request application or other document that deals with a lot, a map or plan or survey, another document that may be deposited, and an electronic conveyancing document. So when we're talking about instruments, we're really talking about a range of documents that have a bearing on the title that may be used in conjunction with this concept of registration. And a short lease is also defined. I think Gregory was the first onto this one. A short lease means a lease for a period of three years or less and um, or from year to year or a shorter period. Now, I hope I, I said the right thing previously. Now I'm starting to doubt what I said. So a short lease is up to and including three years. A long lease is after three, beyond three years. I may have said the wrong thing earlier. Okay, I'm not sure. I can't remember. Um, so. Three years, um, well, over three years you register. Yep. So what's the, the idea of registration is to protect the interest because there is some exceptions to indefeasibility in terms of short leases is the bottom line. And you've got to consider it from the perspective of protecting options as well in a commercial situation. I'm um, sorry, John, Monique again. Yes, I Monique. promise I won't rope anyone no, no. into this one. Um, right. About leases that have options to renew, 
And if we're looking at the um, duration of a lease to determine whether it qualifies as a short-term lease, is it just the initial period and you ignore the options to renew? So if you've got a yeah. three-year lease, that's yes. then, you know, option to renew for another, you know, two, yes. three-year terms, it is a short-term lease. Because yes, it's, you, you, yes. Oh, that's right. You only that look sense. at the initial term. Exactly. Thank you. All right, so thank you. Um, all right, so now I mentioned just the question of end of feasibility in the context of leases. Have a look at the decision, it's in your study guide, Mercantile Credits Limited against Shell Australia, 1976 136 CLR. The High Court dealt with the question of the extent of end of feasibility of covenants in a lease relating to the renewal of the lease, which is options. And in that case, in the context of a registered lease, which included an option to renew, the High Court held that the right of renewal was so connected with the term granted in the lease that it was regarded as part of the estate being created. Does that make sense? So the protection of indefeasibility in relation to that registered lease went beyond the initial term and included protection for the option entitlements based on mercantile credits against Shell. That's if it's registered. If it's not registered, then the, lent, the tenant will lose the benefit of indefeasibility. Uh, that principle doesn't go so far as to deal with options to purchase, even if they're contained within the lease. Some other issues to do with indefeasibility relate to mortgages. Um, so you often, with a mortgage, in the old days, what we'd see is a mortgage would actually say, this is a mortgage in relation to an advance of $100,000. Here are the terms. All of that would be spelled out in the mortgage document. Banks don't do that now. What they commonly do is they purport to secure all money lent under the mortgage. And what that means is that loan agreements, and there might be one or there may be more, which are supported by the mortgage, are documents that are off title. They're not registered. So the loan agreements are not registered. So the question is, is the bank protected in relation to those monies that are secured by loans which are not registered? And generally the answer is yes, they are. And what I'm just highlighting there is that there are a couple of things which are on the borderline as to whether or not indefeasibility protects the interest of the party. And in both those cases, uh, the answer would be yes. <clears throat> um, all right, what else do we want to talk about? Um, an entitlement to search the register and some others. So the registrar must keep a register of uh, interest. So have a look at sections 27, 28. You have an entitlement to search the register, which is 35. Those of you that are doing conveyancing, you would have heard me last night talk about going up to the titles office and physically asking for the book, which was the volume, and then flicking through to look at the folio. So we don't have that now, but that's what it used to be like in the good old days. That's even within my time. Um, I've mentioned Fraser and Walker. I've mentioned Bresk, Farr and Wall. Did everyone follow the facts of those cases? Some guidelines in the material. Do you want me to run through it or are you fine with those? All right. I've said there won't be a question on it, so I don't need to do, do, go into that further. Time's getting away from me. So I'll just mention one other thing in closing. Um, and then if there's any other questions, that's if there are any questions, that's great. I just want to talk about encroachments because that's a really odd area in that you've got something where there's an encroachment from one property onto another. And it kind of blurs the lines of indefeasibility because uh, how can you have indefeasible title in relation to something which is not really yours and it's on your land, but it's not yours, that sort of thing. Which brings me to the other important piece of uh, legislation in Queensland, uh, which is the Property Law Act. So have a look at section 185 of the Property Law Act. It provides the court power to order the removal of an encroachment and uh, it can allow that encroachment to stay on for a limited time. 
If the court declines to make the order to remove the encroachment, it may be that the person is entitled to remove that part of the building which encroaches onto their property, or alternatively, the court may grant damages. Um, so there are whole things that you need to consider. For example, if there's a, a very old building that encroaches and it's um, you know three stories high, it would be it would not be feasible to order the removal of that encroachment. Um, it may be an issue that could be resolved through damages, or it might be that the, the titles are physically changed and a new survey plan is drawn up and the title then matches what's on built rather than the other way around. So section 185 deals with different ways to deal with um, a difficult problem of encroachments. Okay, so that's all I propose to talk about tonight. Are there any questions, comments? All good? Thank you for your contribution this evening. And I'm looking forward to this document that uh, Monique has suggested that we create. And I think it's a really good idea. Okay, we'll see you all next week. Bye then.